Can you hear me? Woo! Okay. All right. When I say good, you say trouble. Good? Trouble. Good? Trouble. Good? Trouble. Okay, um, my name is Jaxadi Velasquez. I'm going to be a sophomore at Northeastern University this fall. Um, I'm going to be majoring in cl clinical research psychology and a combined major in criminal justice. Um, I just want to thank you all for coming today. Um, so, a few months ago when this, wait, can I take this off? Like, is that a thing? Okay. So, a few months ago when this movement gained a lot of support due to the wrongful murder of George Floyd and many of the other innocent black people who have been wrongfully killed, I began to see people questioning the importance of black and colored lives. I saw people argue against this movement and issue by saying things like, all lives matter, or do you not care about babies? <laughs> to those people who think that by saying black lives matter, we're trying to minimize the importance of all lives, I say to you, that your logic makes no sense. Because by going with that logic and if stating that the importance of an oppressed group is oppressing the rest, then you should have a problem when you hear someone say whale lives matter. Is your counter argument going to be all animal lives matter? I don't think so. Because because the issue and the reality is that you have a problem with the fact that a group of black and colored people is fighting back alongside white allies and trying to make a change against the systematic racism that is in our country. This systematic racism wasn't created overnight though. Actually, it's been more than 400 years. Many of us have the understanding that in 1619, the, fir the first 20 Africans were forcefully brought over to Jamestown. But by 1619, there were already 500,000 enslaved Africans that had already been brought across the Atlantic, primarily to places like Brazil and Spanish colonies in South America and the Caribbean. With that context, we see a few things, and those are the reality that slavery up to that point was not new, and transatlantic slave trade was not new. Both of these had begun around 1516. But what is new in 1619 is that it's the beginning of a more racialized type of slavery. This particular form of racial, racialized slavery develops in what becomes America. 1619 is the beginning that creates the racial caste system and ideas, ideologies of white supremacy and black inferiority. All of the systematic racism in our country stems from hundreds of years of racism. Do you remember being taught that if you repeat something seven times or more, you'll remember it? <laughs> Which is why there should be no surprise that there is systematic racism in our country today, because it's been hundreds of years. But by you being here today, you are in support of all of the black and colored people who fought and continue to fight for their rights, which is why I want to thank you again for being here. I hope that you continue to be fired up over this issue and continue to see change. Thank you. So up next we have Melissa Harding Ferretti. Chairwoman of Herring Pond, One Panag, and Indigenous Women's Leadership. Okay, I think, oh, okay. I, I usually don't have trouble everyone hearing me. <laughs> All right. Thank you for having me today. Waniki Suck, Natasuis, Melissa Ferretti, 
Nutomas, Siquana Makwapakwit, Ka Natai Patuxit. What I said in my language is good afternoon. My name is Melissa Ferretti. I am from the Herring Pond Tribe of Plymouth. I am the current chairwoman of the Herring Pond Wampanoag Tribe. I am a mother and grandmother raised in Cedarville by an elder of my tribe. I have lived on my homelands all my life. I am pleased to have this opportunity to speak with you all today on this beautiful land, what is now known as Plymouth, but which is also the homelands of the Herring Pond Wampanoag. Because of my deep-rooted connection to this land and my love and commitment to this place and to my tribal community, I am honored to be here today to talk to you about racial healing and justice from my perspective as a native woman and a tribal leader. As a tribal leader, I think it's important to discuss these issues and I am very committed to public education with the goal of, in the words of the great John Lewis, making good trouble and necessary trouble. A bedrock principle of indigenous societies is to establish good relations with our neighbors. And we see this as an important opportunity to share with the public what our principles and values are as a tribal community. The Herring Pond Wampanoag Tribe stands in solidarity with all indigenous people, people of color, two-spirit and LGBTQ people who are engaged in struggles against racism and oppression and in struggles for peace and justice. Unlike Euro-American patriarchal society, sorry, Indigenous societies in Northeast have always been matrilineal, meaning the women in our communities hold a great deal of power and responsibility. As colonists themselves observed, Native women were the backbone of tribal economies and their political views, their voices were influential in their communities. In Indigenous matrilineal societies, Women have been the final decision makers on matters concerning land, food distribution, and ensuring the safety and future of the tribe. Indigenous women were and are considered sacred and respected as the bringers of life in their nations. Yet today, Native women in North America face the highest rates of gender violence over 75% of which is committed by non-native men. Most non-natives know nothing about this. As a woman and a tribal leader, it is my responsibility to listen to the voices of other indigenous women, scholars, educators, leaders, and activists who are also dedicated to this positive change. Among the brilliant indigenous women leaders today, who are making that positive change is Fawn Sharp of the Quinault Indian Nation in Washington State. She is the current president of her tribal nation and in 2019 was elected president of the National Congress of American Indians, which was founded in 1944. I would like to share a quote from Fawn Sharp, whose leadership is a crucial model for me in a recent article called A Centennial Celebration of Suffrage, Fawn Sharp, the voice of the Quinaults, Sharp, when asked about the source of her commitment to serve her people, said, quote, every single day I am inspired by the idea that I'm the voice of the Quinaults, people who have existed since time began. I'm also the voice of the Quinaults yet to be born and the voice of our ancestors. Holding public office means you have a sacred responsibility to honor the ones who have spent their lifetimes in tremendous energy and resources to advance a nation. As I speak to you today, I am strengthened by Fawn Sharp's words, and I share the same depth of responsibility to my own tribal nation. 
It is this deeply rooted responsibility and commitment that has always driven indigenous women to do the work of fighting for justice for their people. So I will end by saying that indigenous women will continue to make the kind of good necessary trouble that the great civil rights leader John Lewis talked about. As Lewis wrote before he passed, democracy is not a state, it is an act and, a, and each generation must do its part to help build democracy. Thank you. Another round of applause for Melissa. So, the next speaker is going to be Donna Curtin, Executive Director of Pilgrim Hall Museum, reckoning with Plymouth Slave Pass. Good evening, everybody. It's an honor to, uh, to be able to join you this evening. So the first step in reckoning with difficult history is to acknowledge it. Yes. And the primary focus of our local history has long been the region's early English settlement, the later mythologizing of the Pilgrim story in Plymouth Rock. But I'm here to tell you tonight, Plymouth has a slave past. Now, it didn't begin in 1620. There were no slaves aboard the Mayflower. It didn't begin here in 1619 when the first enslaved Africans arrived in Virginia, as Yaksari pointed out. Plymouth slaves past began earlier than that. It began in 1614, right here where you're standing tonight in what was then the Wampanoag village of Patuxet. 20 Wampanoag men and boys were kidnapped from their homes, taken by the English explorer Thomas Hunt and his crew, transported thousands of miles across the ocean and sold into slavery in Europe. Only one of these captives was ever known to have been able to return home. That was to Squantum or Squanto as we know him, who later provided essential support to the Pilgrim's early colony here in Plymouth. Now, one early account written by a 25-year-old Mayflower passenger, Edward Winslow, describes what this 1614 loss here to the community of Patuxet meant. On an expedition down the Cape to Nauset, he and a group of Pilgrim men encountered a Wampanoag mother. As Winslow writes, she was an old woman whom we judged to be no less than a hundred years old. She could not behold us without breaking forth into great passion, weeping and crying excessively. They told us she had had three sons who when Master Hunt was in these parts, went aboard his ship to trade with him, and he carried them captives into Spain, by which means she was deprived of the comfort of her children and never saw her boys again. The grieving mother thought that these new Englishmen might be able to help her locate her children. Instead, they gave her trinkets. Now, this episode of human trafficking is a documented part of Plymouth's early history, but at best, it's been only a footnote in the standard narratives of our history. Until, as part of Plymouth's 400th anniversary commemoration, a team of Wampanoag advisors and a Wampanoag-owned production company gave it voice in a brilliant and still ongoing exhibition called Our Story and I recommend you all look that up online. I believe there's a, a full digital version of it available now. Beyond 1614, Plymouth's history includes the brutal and oppressive colonization of indigenous people as English settlement expanded. Harsh conditions of indentured labor, 
in many ways indistinguishable from slavery, were imposed on many Wampanoag people through debt peonage that deprived individuals of their personal freedom and gradually dispossessed Native families across the region of their homelands. In the aftermath of King Philip's War, Wampanoag survivors, some were executed, others were enslaved, some locally here in Plymouth, and others sent to the deadly sugar plantations of the West Indies, where remarkably there are living Wampanoag descendants there still today. Now I should say in passing that Massachusetts has the distinction of being the first colony in America to formally endorse the ownership and sale of human property. The 1641 Body of Liberties formally declared that there should never be bond slavery except, except for lawful captives taken in just wars or such strangers as willingly sell themselves or are sold to us, exempting none. A tragic loophole. <laughs> Reckoning with Plymouth slave past begins with indigenous enslavement, but black slavery existed here too. It remains a question for us. When did the first non-indigenous person of color arrive here in Plymouth? There are references in early records going back as early as 1622. Uh, and there is, in 1653, the record of a maid servant of one John Barnes who was brought before the court for selling some, or perhaps giving away some of her master's tobacco. And we're not certain as the conditions of servitude and slavery in this period were fluid and not always readily distinguished by the terminology used, whether or not John Barnes's maid servant was enslaved or was indeed what we would think of as a servant. But I will say this, by the late 17th century, no one in Plymouth could have been ignorant of the presence of enslaved people of color here in this community. Thomas Willette, an important colony magistrate, a diplomat and a merchant who at one time lived in a prominent house right up the street in what is today Town Square appears to have been involved in an early slave trading venture in Boston and at the time when his inventory was taken in 1674 was the owner of eight slaves listed as his property. But beyond knowing of the presence, we know very little about the origins, identities, or experiences of Plymouth's enslaved black population and this is partly because we haven't looked. Reckoning with difficult histories means we've got to look harder and we've got to look deeper at sources. We've got to look at old sources in new ways and from differing perspectives. We have to recognize the biases and the silences in the historical record. We have to acknowledge our own racial and cultural blinders. So let me say some names to you here tonight. Caesar, Hester, Eunice, Philip, Esther, Cato, Jesse, Britton, Cuffy, Nanny, Hannah, Flora, Isak, Dick, Phoebe, Dolphin, Rose, Prince, Plymouth, Jane, Jack, Patience, Pero, Hannah, Quamini, Quash, Phyllis, Silas, Venus, Pompey, Cuba, Plato, Ebed, Melek. These were all the names of enslaved African-born or African-American men, women, and children that lived right here in this community in the middle decades of the 18th century. The list was compiled by a local historian, William T. Davis, over a century ago. And since that time, there has been very little in-depth historical work that has been done on Plymouth's enslaved population, or for that matter, on Plymouth's black history in any time period. It's not unusual, and I have heard it said, well, the record is just too fragmentary, there's not enough documentation, the population of color is too small to be significant, that in the larger picture, these stories don't matter. Well, we need to accept the challenge. We need to piece these fragments together. Plymouth's slave past is significant, 
Slavery was a part of everyday life in Plymouth for centuries. People of color were bought and sold here. Plymouth households included enslaved men, women, and children. We need to dig deeper, to investigate, to recover the orig origins, the identities, and experiences of members of our historical community whose presence has been hidden, silenced, and overlooked. So I will say to you, let's recover the story of Britton Hammond. Why doesn't every school kid in Plymouth know his name? He was an enslaved man in the household of General John Winslow, who lived for a time at the head of North Street, where he, today you can buy a very tasty cupcake from the Guilty Bakery. <laughs> he was the first published African-American author in the country. And the narrative of his remarkable adventures, his enslavement and his sufferings, first appeared in print in 1760. Let's recover the story of enslaved African-American Caesar, Wat Caesar Watson of Plymouth, who not only managed to emancipate both of his children from slavery, but also right up the street in Town Square, in the building still standing today, the 1749 courthouse, he sued his owner for his own freedom in 1771, a full decade before slavery was abolished in Massachusetts. And he won. And one last story, it comes from a work of fiction, Kwashi Kwandi. His fight to keep his African name included standing up to beatings and having food withheld while he was a child. His story appears in a work of fiction, but he wasn't just a character in a novel. Kwashi Kwandi lived in Plymouth. His legal name was indeed African. It is the Akan name for a male child born on a Sunday. He also lived right up the street where the post office is today. And he named his son according to his Akan tradition, Kwamini, a male child born on a Sunday, an unmistakable declaration of cultural, cultural identity and resistance. We're in our current moment at a crossroads as unresolved issues about our past confront us with new urgency, but there couldn't be a better time for us to recover these voices and others that have been absent from historical investigation in Plymouth. And I hope many of us will be inspired to do this work. Thank you. So up next, actually, before I um, announce the next speaker, how many of you have heard of any of those names? Were any of you taught any of that in school? I just wanted to, I was curious. Um, so up next, we have a Plymouth North High School student. Her name is Karen Fan. <laughs> Throughout this pandemic, we've all, in our own way, have fought tirelessly in this movement to seek truth and bring light to a matter. There we go. Have fought tirelessly in this movement to seek truth and bring light to a movement that has always been there. Although for some of us who've lived our their life unbothered and unspoken. This time in history feels like a slow journey to justice. But imagine what it feels like to live every day like this, eagerly waiting for the world to turn upside down. I express my gratitude to have developed a website that allows us to all contactlessly learn together the true meaning of what American is, let alone America's hometown. This pandemic has been a river with currents of challenges, but together one pebble at a time, we can make a difference in another, another's life. As one of the youths here, I truly believe there's a lot of change that can be made leading to a stronger and smarter community where the truth actually brings peace and justice. With that being said, under the rock means uncovering the history that the rock hides underneath. To rewrite history, I studied the Thanksgiving dinner narrative more closely. The very first interactions with the Wampanoags. 
why I want to share with you today that despite your age, you can break through the sugar-coated layers that are presented to us through our everyday lives. These social injustices are intergenerational. It's our problem. We do nothing good by hiding the truth. By highlighting the alliance between the pilgrims and the Wampanoags, we distort their realities to make it more comfortable for us. The massacres of the Native Americans did in fact happen, and this land was not given on a compromise term. It has always been like this. We are rooted in a facade. The Native Americans have been victims of colonization since 1616. This history of oppression under the hand of the patriarchy has been a threat to the existence of minorities for a very long time. We demand progressive amendment to our legislation, but we must question why do we have to ask for human rights? Broken systems become normal when we allow them to. That's why we need to be the pebble. No matter how little you are, the resilience of our, vo our voices can be the change in the direction of the waters, the Wampanoags, African Americans, and women who have faced beneath the surface for centuries. We will not float on this river. If we want change, then it starts with each one of us taking initiative to be aware of the current climate issues. We are not the rock we are celebrating. We will be the pebble of promise for the future. Thank you. So up next we have Reverend Lawrence Nunes spoken word artists and the topic of their poem is disciples of christian tabernacle mission in well actually i think that's their church that might be the yep so um yeah their the, to the topic of their poem is ingredients of a legacy the life of john lewis Good evening. What builds a legacy? Most of us assume that it's the accolades collected in a lifetime, a success story that sorts out opportunities when obstacles seem bigger than life itself. We can tell the narrative of our hard work and the mountains that we climb that got us to where we are. We can mention our entry level to the present position we find ourselves in. People love to cater to the attraction of our titles and positions that we have with no qualms and they have an, an easy understanding of honoring you. They sing praises to athletes and entertainers, giving all the glory to statistics of scoring titles, championships, Grammys, and Oscars. And no one can take that away from them. A legacy that appears to be a God-given attribute. But when it comes to leaving a legacy, there is always a backdrop to the story larger than the person, and that is sacrifice. Imagine Cassius Clay never taking the time to change his name to Muhammad Ali, never tapping into his consciousness and went into the military. What would his legacy look like? Martin Luther King never seeking Imagine Martin Luther King never answering the call to seek civil rights. He would have been an ordinary preacher trying to make a name for himself. Malcolm X, Fred Hampton, Huey P. Newton, and the like who challenged the government to do better. Imagine if they took the road less traveled. More than likely, they would be a little less than a footnote in society. Even Christ himself allowing the cup to pass from him would put us all in an ugly predicament. Sacrifice holds the weight of what legacies are made of. Sacrifice takes us to a place where life can be, <clears throat> sacrifice can take us to a place where life can get uncomfortable. Sacrifice stirs the pot, creates troubled waters. 
Sacrifice doesn't settle for less than the normal routine of doing it without move, making moves or making waves. Today's society seems to lose its way with what appears to be normal, now labeled unpatriotic. We still have to explain the ideology of kneeling to the national anthem and its constitutional privilege of quietly protesting. Yet we never ask questions of the reason. We get tone deaf, shape our own understanding because kneeling doesn't seem normal. Colin Kaepernick saw the contract of the Constitution being broken against people of color, realizing how un-American, unpatriotic it is to allow police brutality to continue against American citizens. He too took upon the mantle of sacrifice. Sacrifice demands change. Sacrifice gives the birth to a revolution. It doesn't mind rolling up its sleeve and stirring up creating good works. Sacrifice knows that there could be consequences and casualties. It offers up risk that could end up having career ending, fi financial suicide, or health threatening, or even all of the, of the above. But that's exactly what being chosen and being called by God is. When things don't seem to sit right within your spirit, when compromising is no longer an option, when you see people starving for justice and depleted from humanity, conviction, consciousness will always lead you to the fight for what is right. Leaving a legacy such as John Lewis will always be on the right side of history because he too knew the tradition of normal doesn't sit well within his community. John Lewis couldn't sit still. Idleness was the equivalency to silence. It wasn't in his nature to be quiet and let being undervalued, underestimated, marginalized go unchecked. When we talk about sacrifice, the dedication to commit is bigger than you. You become the front runner to whatever comes your way. And John Lewis was such a man, a freedom writer that danced with Jim Crow. Between segregation and voter suppression, his hands would always toil the weed of injustice. Being arrested never prevented him from doing the will of God. A fractured skull never deterred him from praying for his oppressors while seeking civil liberties for all. This is what sacrifice looks like. And we thank him for his servitude and to all those that heeded to the calling of God. <laughs> Black lives matter. I am more than a slogan that streams, that screams attention without answers. I am more than picket signs that shouts awareness without acknowledgement, revealing bylaws of American shortcomings. I am but a brick to be a building block upon the foundation of many, sacrificing a sacrificial lambs for those to move ahead of me. Black Lives Matter is the pebble rolling upward, collecting souls to freedom into a mountain unmoved, picking a lock that that prohibits unwelcome doors called denial. Voter suppression invites insurrection, making me speak volumes of turn up for what I believe in. So I borrow elbow grease, press to, the clean, press to clean the slate of racism. Even if you dare turn the knob down to quiet the sound of cadence, you'd still hear the sound of Negro spirituals singing George Floyd's prophecies. The voices of people weeping in harmony, wailing to the melody of deep plight and pain. There is no mute button to silence our grievances. So we trouble the waters, expose the sediments of sin, seeped into the soil of Virginia, colonies that were contagious of chattels. Today's news views the blues due to the statues of the darker hue. Black lives mattered long before cameras told stories unbelievable. Stories buried by cross burnings and postcard lynchings. Visitations, threat of, th visitations threats of Stone Mountain gang violence. Black Lives Matter long before Mamie Till made a decision to have an open casket. Black Lives Matter long before George Holiday pressed record televised the intimacy between Rodney King and the LAPD. Black Lives Matter long before Jill Gil Scott Heron hid the revolution from Facebook. Black Lives Matter 
<clears throat> Through Oscar Grant, Sandra Bland, Philando Castile, Tamir Rice, Sean Bell, Trevon Martin, Brianna Taylor, Mike Brown, George Floyd. We can roll back the casualties of war until police reform. Still, we will say their names, resurrecting the gift of their existence. Black Lives Matter too. It's just that our consciousness will never let their names be undone. Thank you. So um, can we give Reverend Lawrence another hand of applause? I haven't met you yet, but that was amazing. I just wanna. Um, so up next we have Virginia Davis, president of Plymouth Antiquarian Society. The Townbrook Committee, um, she's in the Townbrook Committee and um, the topic of her speech is women as community leaders in the 20th century. This is always a challenge. Can you hear me? This is some personal reflections as I begin to talk about the Townbrook Committee. Brewster Gardens has been a part of my life forever. I was born and raised in the big a brick building that's at the West End here called the Eman Building. It was built by my grandfather in 1914 and my dad inherited it and I grew up there and so Brewster Gardens was where I came with galoshes in the mud mud played in the sun and uh, slid down whatever kind of hill we could find in the snow and it's now um, so that's why I start the story here it kind of weaves around you're probably gonna go when is she gonna get to community Am I can you hear me now could you hear the first part? Yeah. Okay, okay. So when I was growing up, Brewster Gardens was visible from my bedroom window. I lived on the second floor. And so I could look out and the trees that you see here were much, much smaller then, okay? And I could look out over the garden, I could see the change of seasons and I could see to the harbor. So you're probably wondering, where is she going with this story? Well, as a youngster growing up there, my father would often talk about a Mrs. Belcher and about a Dr. Nellie Pierce. And he always spoke with a, kind of a reverence about these ladies. They were on the Town Brook Committee, and this will be explained later. And how this came about was if there was an issue in this garden, and my dad noticed it, he would get in touch with Mrs. He would get in touch with Mrs. Belcher or Mrs. Or, Dr. Nelly, and they in turn would go to the selectmen or the park department, but they were really the guardians of this town. Okay. Okay. Now to the essence of this talk. What qualities does a civic-minded woman possess? Integrity, excellent communication skills, both written and oral, imagination, vision, bravery, patience, but the patience to know when it's time to take action, and lastly, generous and kind. So for this, I've chosen Dr. Helen Pierce, affectionately known as Dr. Nellie. She was born in 1861 and lived to 1953. She was born in Manamet on a farm. Manamet's a little town south of here, to a very humble pair of parents and her father became blind when she was a teenager. So she had to take over all the household chores and her mother had to take over the farm. She was a very bright girl and did very well in school. And so she managed with all this responsibility to still graduate from Plymouth High School in 1878. She was then 
became a teacher for a while because in those days, sometimes if you graduated from high school, you could be an elementary teacher. She did that for a few years and then decided she wanted to become a physician and went off to Boston University, completed four years in three years. Her first assignment as a physician was at LaSalle Seminary. And it was here during um, some type of a project in Symphony Hall that a platform collapsed and her back was severely injured. She was in a wheelchair for six years, but eventually recovered, returned to Plymouth, and started her own practice on North Street. Now, a, war a civic woman, besides being a doctor, she was on the planning board, or the planning committee, for the Jordan Hospital, which was built in 1900. And then, of course, it followed, she became on the staff. And what other things did she do? Well, she became, um, you know, I, I, I find it get random because I have this in my mind and I'm not even looking at my paper, so I have to kind of look here. Okay. Um, one example of the type of woman she was, beside being very serious and on committees though, she had a lot of spunk. Around 1917, her chauffeur had to go off to war, to World War I, so she bought an electric car and she learned to drive. That's the kind of lady that she was. She never married and she dedicated her life to her practice and this community. So besides being on the staff of the Jordan Hospital, the first woman doctor in the town of Plymouth, she served as president of the Society of Prevention of Cruelty to Children. Um, and she also served on the civic committee. Now how this comes about is it took 10 years to develop this park. This was not always the park. When Main Street Extension went in and the, par and the uh, bridge was built over there, this was a pond, okay? It was called Rope Walk Pond. It was just a large sewer, exactly, and filled with debris. And so the Townbrook Committee, led by Dr. Nellie Pierce, actually um, got together and got the committees of this town to begin to clean it up. And then through a benefactor, benefactress, um, Mrs. Forbes of Milton, she was a very wealthy woman and um, knew people in Plymouth, was the daughter of, of um, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And she had so much money and loved Plymouth so much that she actually was the one that gave Plymouth the money, came with her own um, Boston architect and designed this park. And um, it came to be, by 1923, we had Brewster Gardens here. So um, I, I chose it because we're here and it's, it's so beautiful. And it was once uh, just derelict. And it was really women because the Townbrook Committee actually was a subcommittee of the Women's Club, which was founded in 1912, right in a big church, which is gone now, at Town Square. And the, the Townbrook Committee was a subcommittee of the Women's Club. So I'm just gonna finish with one sentence. This is a challenge. I'd rather be singing. So when uh, Dr. Nelly died, Mrs. Edward Belcher of the Plymouth Women's Club um, had these words to say of her. Even in the midst of her busy professional life, she gave instintingly to any effort which would make Plymouth a better town in which to live. Thank you. So up next, up, up next, we have
a poem. by Stefan Delbos? Okay. Um, okay, um, so I apologize. This is so confusing. You can introduce yourself. <laughs> I'm Frema's husband. <laughs> I am honored to have been asked to read a poem created by Plymouth's own poet laureate, Stefan Delbos, or Stefan Delbos, entitled Pilgrim Progress, a poem under the rock Plymouth, Plymouth, Port St. Louis, Accomac, Patuxet, 2020. Our history crawls shackled, bleeding, hollering something fierce from under the rock of reality. We finally, working together now, have the strength to pry from the loam of collective memory and lift a little nervous, knee-high into this afternoon, late August when we gather to do this, and our history starts running in circles like a siren's spin around us. See what humans have done to ourselves. Our history has mother's eyes, a father's ears, kneecaps from a cousin, long lost in the branching shadows of our one great family tree. This history is who we were before you and I. Language that tries to hide us from the fact that we are one. We are one because the mystery of consciousness unites us. So we place the rock at history's feet and sit and listen. A light offshore breeze comes up and seems to gently pull each by the shoulders just an inch or so out of the body. We sit and float for a moment. Someone shouts that history has vanished, but history is here, everywhere, like air. And the soil is so fertile in the hollow left by the rock we lifted. Look. Okay, so up next we have Jim Hardiman. Um, so Jim Hardiman, I actually know him from church. Um, and so Jim is really cool because, so 
while having a few conversations with him. He um, actually told me that um, he was acquainted with um, MLK, Martin Luther King Jr., and with um, Malcolm X. Actually, I have mentioned Jim Hardiman in a speech before. So um, anyways, uh, he's our next speaker, and I'm really excited. Thank you, you're sorry. Hi, good evening everyone. Um, this is a treat and an honor to kind of share with you um, sort of my personal travels and how it impacts issues around Black Lives Matter 2020. I've titled my presentation, My Skin Covers My Body, But Not My Character. I welcome this special opportunity to share my personal perceptions and experiences. I welcome this, op this special opportunity to share my personal perceptions and experiences of racial hearing, of healing and good trouble. So near sighted. as expressed by Congressman John Lewis, Dr. Martin Luther King, and so many of my black brothers and sisters from the, six, from the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. I refer to them as brothers and sisters because many of them were personal acquaintances. I came into this world as a child of sharecroppers in Athens, Georgia in 1943. This term may be foreign to you. My parents were not mindful of freedom of choice in housing, freedom of choice to protest, freedom of choice to relocate, freedom of choice of employment, freedom of choice in education. They were limited to first and second grade educations and could barely read and right. My parents were victims of Southern systemic racism because whites took away all of their freedom of choices. America was dedicated to segregation enforced by the Ku Klux Klan and Jim Crow legislative practices. My early childhood was slavery in modern day America. The 13th Amendment, 1865, of the U.S. Constitution abolished slavery. The 14th Amendment, 1866, gave black citizenship. And the 15th Amendment, 1870, gave blacks the right to vote. Yet today, 2020, we are struggling to achieve Dr. King's dream, judge me by my character, and not by the color of my skin. America is still focused on skin color because of the historical factors of power and control. This is a domestic violence outside of the home. My first civil rights march was in Biloxi, Mississippi, 1967. Eight marches later culminated in a march in Washington, D.C., August 27, 1983. I have been a social justice activist most of my adult life. And many of my college peers in the 60s from Howard University have dedicated personal service to speaking for the poor, empowering all marginalized populations, entering political offices, making changes from within the system, demonstrating for more humanized criminal justice systems, and addressing mass incarceration to politicians who would listen, and raising their children and grandchildren to carry the baton of healing 
and doing good trouble. As a military officer during the Vietnam era, I and my family still place our hands over our hearts, as we say the Pledge of Allegiance, and dream someday that the preamble of the Declaration of Independence, July 4th, 1776, will be realized. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Afro-Americans, people of color, and women demand inclusiveness now, not later. Silence and failure to care about individuals standing beside you does not make America great. As a child of a Southern sharecropper who graduated from Harvard University with a graduate degree, I can attest that America has always been great. Even with its historical wounds of social injustice, prejudice, and racism. I would like to take a slight detour from my prepared talk and share with you sort of the trainings that we, meaning blacks in Mississippi, under Dr. Martin Luther King, this is what we sort of had to endure. I mean, I see many of the young people carrying signs of Black Lives Matter on TV. And I reflect back to the 60s and, and what was going on in Mississippi and Georgia and Alabama. We were very disciplined marchers. If you look at the newsreels, many of us had our hands in our pockets. We could not walk and have our fists balled as we were spit upon, hit in the back of the head kicked and in many cases it was law enforcement that was participating in many of these acts we did not have social media to assist us many of us had left Howard University and joined the peace movement in the south helping to try to desegregate America We weren't sure when we got arrested and sitting in jail who was going to bail us out or who was going to come to our aid. There was no medical support, as John Lewis can attest. There were many times that we sat in jail and all we could do was sing the Black Gospels. Many of you may be unaware that Dr. King, when he gave his speech, I Have a Dream, he didn't finish that speech until he got up to the podium. He was still writing the closing of his talk. Many of you may be unaware that when he started this speech, it was in jail. His initial writings were on toilet tissue with a pen that someone had in the cell as we were packed in like sardines. I say to the young people, today. Remember those who preceded you, who opened the path, opened the doors for you to demonstrate here today. In closing, I plead to young activists, demonstrators carrying Black Lives Matter signs, and concerned citizens of all races to mobilize this November 2020 and get out to vote. This is a wonderful way to demonstrate good trouble. Thank you very much. So before I um, announce the next speaker, I just want us to do a little What's the word? Chanting? Is that the? I don't know. Okay, so Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Okay, I know that there isn't a lot of people here today, but you guys have more than that. Okay, Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Louder. Black Lives Matter. Louder. Black Lives Matter. 
All right, and I want us to also say, United We Rise. I saw that poster and I loved it. So, United We Rise. We rise. United We Rise. Okay, let's do that louder, guys. Okay, when I say United, you say We Rise. So, United We Rise. United We Rise. All right. <laughs> so, the next speaker is going to be Allison Rosa, um, a medical assisting teacher at Plymouth South High School and um, a T-R-U-E, Inc. True diversity. True diversity. Um, and the topic of her speech is, I can't breathe. Good evening. I can't breathe. I can't believe this. Mama, I love you. I can't breathe. Those are the words George Floyd cried in hope and in horror with a knee on his neck. Those words broke mother's hearts across the nation. It was time to take a stand for justice. Why not? Women won the right to vote in, dec in a decades-long movement. So why can't we do another one? I can't breathe. Because I'm the mother of two black sons and a beautiful black queen, I worry different. Have fun. Don't forget your keys. Take off your hood. Be careful. Put your hands up. Take an air pot out. Don't try to explain your rights. He's 20, he's serving this country and I can't breathe. He's 16 and I can't breathe. She's one and I will breathe. When you see us, do not say we do not see color. When you see us, see us. We bleed the same, we breathe the same, but yet we can't breathe. I'd like to close with a quote from John Lewis. Do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful, be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never, ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good, good trouble, necessary trouble. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a lovely speech. No problem. Um, so our next speaker is going to be Dan Borelli. And the topic of their, uh, their speech is going to be role of the arts in creating a new future by challenging the present. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yeah? Uh, thanks for the invitation to speak. Uh, my name is Dan Borelli and I'm an artist from Ashland, Massachusetts. Publicly known as home of the electric clock. Privately is one of the first 10 super fun sites in the US. So I grew up on a cancer cluster that produced death. And as an artist, I work with this community to make visible their trauma and loss so we could begin to heal. And um, while that was an environmental justice project, I'm starting a project on Plymouth. I'm interrogating systems that we've been conditioned to no longer see. I make them visible by shifting formal aspects, and I'm initiating this project that links the Plymouth Rock, the meeting house at the plantation, with the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Plant waste site as a, as a linked network in what can be called the white spatial imaginary. 
Culture and identities are intertwined with ecology, and we claim certain outgrowths, plants, and other geology as a way to shape our social constructs. I've been interested in some time in the mythology surrounding the Plymouth Rock. It's dwarfed by its portico design by McKim, Mead, and White. You realize the rock is clearly staged, and the theatrics are an attempt to emphasize the nativist origin story that colonial cultures claim around this piece of geology. In making a full-scale replica that you see here, I am playing, I'm taking on the role of artist as trickster, making a fake, a decoy of the original, decontextualizing it from its historical space. And the mobile device exposes the slipperiness of this symbol while puncturing the current belief that there is only a singular definition of what it means to be an American. Art, art has a capacity to transform hearts, to shift narratives, to disrupt the present, not simply beautify. In order to create a new future, one that is more just and equitable, we have to actively dismantle the past. We have to confront those legacies that persist and crystallize into the present. By dismantling these past structures, we can begin to look forward to the larger question of the future. How are we collectively inhabiting this earth together? Thank you. long ago is this still as loud can you can you hear me okay so not very long ago um, some friends and I were counter protesting um, near here and so we were just chanting black lives matter and um, some people got very upset so I say that just to say that when I tell you to chant, don't be like afraid or don't be, um, don't like hold back because there will be people who will be upset. But like, um, this is a very important cause and um, it's significant. So don't minimize it. Anyways, so um, this time we're going to chant Indigenous Lives Matter. So one, two, three. Indigenous Lives Matter. Indigenous Lives Matter. Indigenous Lives Matter. Um, and one more time, I love that. United we rise. United. We rise. United. We rise. United. We rise. United. We rise. Woo. So up next we have Annie Jager from Plymouth South High School. Um, and she's from the class of 2022 and she's a member of No Place for Hate. And the topic of her speech is embracing uncertainty. My name is Annie Yeager, and I'm the Plymouth South High School liaison for the Plymouth No Place for Hate Committee. I want to talk to you about certainty. There are things in life we think we know, but how many things are we actually completely certain of? When you think about it, it's not nearly as many as you would hope. I'm certain of my name, who my family is, what school I go to, and where I'm standing right now. And besides a few extras, there isn't much we can add to that list. One of those things we can't be certain of is our beliefs and our role regarding social issues. We can read all the books available, listen to all the TED Talks and speeches we can find, and educate ourselves on social media, and we might feel like we've truly got it. Like we know everything there is to know about activism and the constantly changing social climate. And then we might see something wrong or learn something new that forces us to reevaluate what we thought we knew. This can be discouraging. 
It's really hard not being able to fully understand something that you care so much about, but that's often the case with things worth caring about. Our world is changing quickly around us, and it can be hard for one person to keep up. However, we can't let these moments hold us back. We have to be okay with making mistakes and admitting when we were wrong. It's e easy to say this and believe it, but in practice, it's much more difficult. For me, my first instinct is to be stubborn and deny that I even made a mistake in the first place. I'd rather save face than admit there's something I didn't know. It's easy to pretend you never made a misstep, but it's much harder to realize that you're not perfect. That's the whole point of social change. Not only to change society, but to change ourselves. It takes courage to admit your uncertainties and mistakes, but I found it's a skill we can grow over time. If we were all certain of our beliefs and what we thought was wrong and right, social change would be impossible. Certainty can be ignorance, and it leads to division. The current political division in our country and government is a perfect example of this issue. Each party is so completely sure that they're right that they're not willing to see any truth in what the other party is saying. Everyone gets so defensive about their beliefs that no one is willing to listen and have an actual conversation. In order to grow as individuals and as a country, we have to be willing to be unsure. We have to recognize that we still have so much left to learn and we will never have it completely right. But the act of trying to get there is what makes us better. This has been a difficult lesson for me to learn. As a perfectionist, I don't like to be uncertain. As a 16-year-old, I struggle with the idea of knowing that there's so much I don't know. I like to educate myself as much as I can so that I'm never vulnerable or caught off guard. It took me a few years of activism to learn that I will never know everything. There will always be someone more informed, something new to learn. Once I finally figured that out, I discovered how exciting it can be to be continually learning about this complex, ever-changing movement. Acceptance of imperfection and uncertainty is a two-way street. It can be easy to feel superior to someone less informed than you. I have to admit that I've done this. It's an ego boost. It makes you feel better about your own uncertainty. We have to fight this urge. Instead of pushing people away for something saying, saying something outdated or politically incorrect, let's be empathetic. We've all been there. We know what it's like to make honest mistakes when you're trying to do the right thing. The best way we can grow together is if we're willing to have open conversations about what's going on and how we can do better going forward. In a time of division and conflict, we won't accomplish anything by angrily tweeting people about things we dis disagree with or posting something passive aggressive on All Things Plymouth. I have a lot to learn about activism, but I do know that shaming someone behind the wall of social media won't lead to any kind of positive change. People are complicated and not as one-sided as they may seem, but they can get defensive when they feel attacked. We need to figure out a way to talk to one another and disagree without taking sides. This is easier said than done. I have at times found myself full of righteous indignation, preparing some clever comeback to shame someone for not getting it right, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who has felt this way. The second thought, the one, the one that comes after your instinct and tells you to be human and empathetic is the one you need to listen to. Teach yourself how to be kind and patient with yourself and others, because that is an essential step to growing as people and as a society. The most important thing to do is to keep listening and keep learning. I know it's overwhelming and it's easy to climb back into your shell and ignore everything that's going on. Fight the instinct to be complacent and push yourself to learn, make mistakes, and grow. Okay, so up next we have the wonderful Harrison Quinn. He's a teacher from Plymouth South High School. No, he's a civics teacher at Plymouth Community Intermediate School and the topic of his speech is why civic matters.
publicly speak for a living and for some reason this seems terrifying already, but <laughs> here we go. So thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for being here. It really warms my heart to see so many of you working on your civic responsibilities. <laughs> I'm Harrison Quinn, Plymouth South uh, graduate, class of 2005, in eighth grade, that's right, eighth grade U.S. civics history teacher at my alma mater, PCIS. It is truly an honor to be here with you today speaking. Of course, I find it even more of an honor to teach the students of Plymouth. And I'm not just saying that. I truly find it an honor. Every school day, I wake up and I get to go to school. I get to be there and learn with my students. To some, it may not seem like much, but to me and my students, it's everything. Every day, I get to see change in action. As of 2018, it is state law that all eighth graders must receive a civics education. From day one, it is my responsibility to teach about civic duties and civic responsibilities. Not many know the difference between the two, so if you allow me, I'll teach you. <laughs> civic duties are actions that are required by law, while civic responsibilities are actions that are suggested but not required. We may roll our eyes at our civic duties, like jury duty and paying our taxes, but we do them, not only because we are legally bound to do so, but we clearly see their value. Today, I would like to focus on our civic responsibilities, actions we can take to improve our community. These responsibilities may not be mandated by law, but they are of critical importance. Embracing our civic responsibilities ensures our country's progress. Marching in the name of truth, justice and equality, that's your civic responsibilities in action. Voting for your hopes and not your fears, that's your civic responsibilities in action. <laughs> Helping those in their time of need, registering your friends to vote, and exercising your First Amendment rights, those are your civic responsibilities in action. Now, I understand the fear that can come with even the most peaceful of progress. It's okay to be afraid. It's not okay to let that fear control you. And if you need to, you can look throughout our history to see others who have braved the wrath of society for a chance to make change. The idea of civic responsibilities reminds me of a very simple, yet undeniably true quote that Governor William Bradford wrote in his journal. He said, thus out of small beginnings, greater things have been produced. And as one small candle may light a thousand, so the light here, kindled, hath shone onto many. Throughout our town's history, we have seen many examples of that one candle. There was Deborah Sampson lying about her gender to fight in the Revolutionary War. There was Mercy Otis Warren using her quill to advocate for the passage of the Bill of Rights. And there was humorist and civil rights activist Dick Gregory who once said, if democracy is such a good thing, then let us have more of it. <laughs> and even our Commonwealth is filled with those who shined a light on oppression. Quack Walker and Ma Bet, two Massachusetts slaves, read Article One of the U.S. Constitution that said, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Article One of the Massachusetts Constitution that said, all men are born free and equal, who then sued for their freedom and won effectively outlawing slavery in Massachusetts 84 years before the 13th Amendment. And our country is filled with those who were the spark for such great change, like John Lewis, who risked his life to use his right to vote, or Eleanor Roosevelt, who famously left the Daughters of the American Revolution in the name of racial justice and equality. Many have made deep sacrifices, faced hatred, vile, and censure, so that we could be here today and I'm asking you to be like those before us, those who sacrifice so much so that we can continue to make history every day. And I recognize that seemingly insurmountable effort 
with so many problems ahead of us, that dangerous thought will inevitably creep into our head. What can I do? I'm just one person, so what can I do? Truthfully, you can do a lot. You can learn the history that has always been there and shine a light on it. You can step out of your echo chamber and engage in conversation with people you may have dismissed, spark knowledge and intrigue in others. You can face oppression and inequality with a fire in your heart. So you can be an upstander instead of a bystander. And you can register to vote. Woo! Woo! You are indeed just one person. One person who has a brain, a heart, and a backbone. You are that one small candle capable of so much. There's nothing you can't do. Thank you. All right, so I say go, you say vote. Go? Vote. Go? Vote. Go? Vote. We should do it seven times, right? Then you'll remember it. <laughs> Um, so last but not least, we have Christina Brown, and she is a member of Indivisible Plymouth and the League of Women Voters. And she is also one of the organizers of, these event, of this event. The topic of her speech is suffrage movement as an exercise in freedom. It's hard to be the last speaker, but it's also hard to be the humanities teacher following the civics teacher, because it's gonna sound like plagiarism, but I was a middle school teacher, so um, I, I can show where it came on my computer. Um, if we can learn to say Plymouth 1620 Pilgrims, we can learn to say Wampanoag 12,000 years Patuxet. We can learn to say Africans, August 20th, 1619, Virginia. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, we honor these words by expanding the narrative to include diverse stories, especially in regards to the fight for the right to vote. As the pandemic of 2020 continues to challenge our nation, we take an equity pause to expand the narrative and shine a brighter light on those who fought so hard and risked so much in the collective struggle fueled by their unwavering belief in the truths put forth by our founders. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As we ponder the 401st anniversary of the first enslaved Africans to arrive, the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the Mayflower to Pawtuxet, and the land of the Wampanoag during a pandemic that had decimated their people, and the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which gave some women the right to vote, I ask us to focus on the suffrage move movement as an exercise in freedom. We have centered our history on those who had access to power, and it's time to consider those who got in good trouble, got arrested, got beaten, and fought for the vote as they moved our country towards a more perfect union in which Americans of all colors, genders, religions, places of birth and identities are more fully included. We know the stories and names of the founding fathers who wrote, debated and signed the Declaration of Independence. But as we consider the quest for suffrage, it might be more important to know the believers who fought to ensure that these words had meaning. We can't form a more perfect union without women of people of cover and color, and we never could. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. We, the people, includes Elizabeth Freeman, an enslaved African known as Mumbet, who lived in Sheffield, Massachusetts in the 1700s. 
She listened as she served the white men who wrote the Sheffield Resolves in 1773, the basis for the Massachusetts Constitution and ideas in the De Declaration of Independence. As she listened to talk about freedom and the rights of all humans, she decided that this included her. In 1781, she engaged a lawyer, Theodore Sedgwick, who had been part of the Sheffield Resolve meetings and she had served him food to sue for freedom. Mumbet won her lawsuit, which used the Massachusetts Constitution and was the end, was the basis for the end of slavery in Massachusetts. Changing her name to Elizabeth Freeman, she lived the rest of her life as a free woman working as a paid housekeeper for the Sedgwick family. We, the people, of the United States in order to form a more perfect union. We the people includes Lucy Stone of Massachusetts who fought equally hard for abolition and for women's rights and was part of the first generation of women starting in 1848 who fought for suffrage but did not live to see the 19th Amendment passed as the battle took 72 years. Lucy Stone was one of the first women to graduate from college and to not take her husband's name things we take for granted in 2020 that women can go to college and choose their last name. The suffragettes dared to dream of a world in which women had an agency in building a more perfect union. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. We, the people, includes Ida B. Wells, who was part of the second generation of suffragettes who lived through the 1918 pandemic and lived to see the 19th Amendment pass. Ida not only fought for suffrage, was a but was a journalist who documented lynching to draw attention to the terrorism and murder of African Americans, totaling 6,500 from 1865 to 1950. Despite her deep knowledge of lynching and brutality, she believed deeply that black lives matter and that the right to vote was a way to form a more perfect union. We now reflect on, on the fact that the 19th Amendment did not enfranchise all women. Native Americans didn't earn the right to vote until 1924, though barriers persist, persisted. Asian Americans until 1952 and African Americans until 1965. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. John Lewis was part of two generations of African Americans that fought for the right to vote and risked life and limb and multiple arrests to see the Voting Rights Acts passed in 1965. His last public act was to stand in Black Lives Matter Plaza in front of the White House, the same place where suffragettes known as the Silent Sentinels stood and were arrested in November 1917 in the Night of Terror for protesting in support of the 19th Amendment, which finally drew more attention to their cause. Separated by a hundred years, white women and people of color joined with white women have both been arrested and beaten in front of the White House fighting for the rights to form a more perfect union. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, must fight for the right to vote and exercise our vote in 2020 and also take the census. Um, the right for this is the story of our country that must come out from under the rock. Early voting starts tomorrow. The census is available always. We must fight for the right to vote, the right to be counted, and the right to tell stories that include all of America and not some of America. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Thank you to all of our speakers for shining a light at the history that is underneath the rock. And we hope that the names that you heard today will be names that will be as easy to recite as 1620 Pilgrim's Rock. When you think of Elizabeth Freeman, when you think of John Lewis, when you think of Quack Walker. Can we name some other names that we heard tonight? Quamini. Lucy Stone, Kwamini Quash. Caesar. Caesar. Ex many, many names. So please Anna. go home, Google it, learn it, share it. In order to find truth and reconciliation, we actually have to know our history and be able to talk about it. Thank you so much.
gold record.